Good afternoon and welcome to the annual RUSI JC Lord Lecture. A particular welcome to all of the RUSI members who are with us today. The lecture is named after an awe-inspiring individual who embodied the values, ethics and morals of those who served and still serve in uniform, but who also represents the reality of experiences in service life from barracks to combat with joint experience across all three uniform services. Regimental Sergeant Major John C. Lord, MVO, MVE, is still a legend in the military, a figure who is known for his exemplary leadership skills. His service in the Second World War included taking part in the seaborne operation to land at Taranto as part of the Allied invasion of Italy. Lord also participated in Operation Market Garden in Arnhem in September 1944, where he dropped with three para and was eventually captured and interred. Lord's leadership in the prisoner of war camp after capture at Arnhem was truly inspirational. In a famous speech to the officers at the Army Staff College in 1963, Lord spoke of the discipline, which he defined as a moral, mental and physical state in which all ranks respond to the will of the commander, whether he is there or not. He learned much from those experiences, as did those around him. The values and attributes that John Law displayed during his life underline what uniform services and uniform service does for individuals and demonstrates what individuals can do for their country as well. JC lived by three famous rules. Firstly, that people will only follow orders in a disciplined manner if they understand why or they trust you. Secondly, he quoted Emerson, trust people and they will be true to you, treat them greatly and they'll show themselves to be great. And his final one, if you want to instill discipline, people must know that you have their best interests at heart. JC Lord believed in the power of discipline to give a body of soldiers the strength of will to fight, survive and win. But his belief was also termed with humanity and humility and his biography, freely available on the internet, is well worth a read to demonstrate some of that. I think JC Lord would deeply approve of the conversations we're having now about the profession of arms. The purpose of this lecture is to give a voice to the people of the British military, to them and for them, representing their views and their experiences. There are around 144 and a half thousand people on active service in the UK, along with 44,000 reserves. Their experiences are not just about the death and destruction they see on the battlefields in which they fight. It's not just about the fun and laughter they experience with their mates. It's not just about the peace and stability they bring to the thousands of people who meet them around the world, nor about their willingness to step in to help and to one, run towards trouble, however bad it is. This lecture is about those things and more. It's about the ecosystem in which they live, the living organism, the unique organi organization and family that supports them. Militaries aren't businesses. They're not like other government departments. The people and the functions they're asked to do are extraordinary. And individually, they perform extraordinary tasks. It's a big ask and one that we do not expect of others in society. In doing so, and over hundreds of years, the collective experiences of the uniformed personnel in performing strange tasks in far-flung lands, the British military have learned how to build a resilient workforce. The lessons gleaned from the armed forces experiences on operations by soldiers, sailors, marines, airmen and airwomen have been deployed regularly during the recent pandemic response over the last year. And it is mental health and mental well-being that is the theme of our lecture today. Our speaker is a mental health champion of the UK Armed Forces. Warren Officer Glenn Houghton, OBE, the Senior Enlisted Advisor to the Chiefs of Staff Committee at the UK Ministry of Defence, joined the Army in 1988 and has a breadth of operational experience that many will recognise, but today few match. Multiple tours in Northern Ireland, Iraq and Afghanistan, Glenn has served all over the world. After a successful and traditional infantry career, Glenn was subsequently Regimental uh, Sergeant Major for the 1st Battalion Grenadier Guards in 2010 and subsequently was selected for a late entry commission in 2012 and appointed as the Academy Sergeant Major at Sandhurst. In January 2015, he became the first uh, British Army Sergeant Major on appointment from the Chief of General Staff. 
and he assumed that appointment in April 2015 as a senior soldier and sergeant major of the British Army. In November 2018, the Chiefs of Staff Committee endorsed, endorsed his appointment as the first enlisted uh, senior enlisted advisor to the Chiefs of Staff Committee, SEAC. And that job involves working with senior warrant officer and sergeant major positions in the Royal Navy, Royal Marines, Army and Royal Air Force to improve the understanding of issues with a primary focus on monitoring the value of the cumulative offer, the professional development opportunities, pay, advancement, opportunities, quality of life, mental health, veterans, families, culture and standards and the general institutional health of the armed forces. I mean, what does all that mean? Effectively, it's a truth to power relationship a Babelfish translator, a thermometer. Glenn holds a unique and influential position. There are few people better placed to give us insights into the tests and trails involved in mental health and well-being in the most demanding of environments and employments and what others can learn from it. The format of this lecture will be remarks by Glenn, then a period of question and answer. Please use the Q&A portal at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And I regret that whilst I have access to the questions, our speaker doesn't. So I'll take your questions and pose them to him. All the problems, therefore, with translating that are my issue and not his. The whole session is on the record. It's being recorded, webcast, live streamed and will be available for download later. And with that, it is once again a real and genuine privilege to welcome you to Rusi again, Glenn. The floor is yours. Uh, Peter, thank you very much indeed. Can I just do a comms check and check you can hear me? You're loud and clear. Brilliant. Thank you very much for the introduction. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for joining us today uh, for the annual JC Lord Lecture. Uh, this is my second JC Lord Lecture. And just like the first, I'm incredibly proud to be able to stand here and speak under the name of such an influential character on my own life and career. A remarkable soldier and human being that has left a lasting legacy on so many. I hope that this lecture can help and influence people in the same way that his famous Staff College speech did over 50 years ago. We are in an era of unprecedented change and viral uncertainty, more widespread, intense and emotive than we have ever experienced before. Since March 2020, we have responded to 304 civilian authority requests for military aid. We have 42 vaccine quick reaction force teams consisting of medically trained personnel deployed all over the country and further non-medical military personnel working to support the rollout to assist in the setup and operation of vaccination centres as well as support the national testing effort. We are also supporting the police as well as planning support to our NATO partners, to our overseas territories and to the National Health Service. The British Army, the Royal Air Force and the Royal Navy have over five and a half thousand people deployed and a further 14,000 at readiness to support the COVID response in the largest ever homeland support operations across all four nations of the UK. Over 1,000 general duties personnel are supporting in non-clinical roles to free up those all important National Health Service staff. Testing, air transport, traffic management, military planners, general duties, local response teams, scientists, medics, doctors, nurses. We haven't had a medical deployment of this scale since the first Gulf War in 1991. But it doesn't stop there. Our mission continues outside of the ongoing COVID operations. As 2021 begins, UK soldiers, sailors, Marines, airmen and women are deployed on operations and exercises all over the world to protect peace, prevent conflict, and keep Britain safe. Afghanistan, Iraq, Mali, Somalia, and Estonia, to name but a few. Over 11,000 of our people are deployed globally in support of training, NATO, and UN peacekeeping missions. They are supporting our allies, deterring our adversaries, and capacity building for global Britain's future security and safety. Right now, the world is waiting for the vaccine to bring this global pandemic to an end. We have a focus on hope, solidarity and well-being, but our challenges won't end if and when the pandemic does. None of us predicted the year that we have just had and none of us can predict the future. Uncertainty and the unknown continues to dog our every step. 
The United Nations recently said that the mental health and well-being of whole societies have been severely impacted by the crisis and are a priority to be addressed. Grief of the loss of loved ones, isolation and restrictions of movement, shock at the loss of lifestyles and jobs, and difficult family dynamics, distress and frustration are widespread. The psychological impact of this pandemic cannot be and must not be underestimated, as much as we are unsure what the impact will be. We must be prepared, and for our military family, that means taking responsibility at the individual level for our own well-being and at the organisational level for leadership, advocacy, support and treatment. Arguably, mental health awareness has never been more necessary or more talked about. But let me ask you this, is it understood? What actually is mental health? There is no general agreement on the definition of mental health and it's often interchangeable with mental illness, therefore impeding understanding of the full range of mental health. For me, I think mental health is a sliding scale, a continuum. There are various degrees between healthy mental wellness and clinically diagnosed mental illness, with most of us falling at some point in between on different days or different stages of our lives. In the course of a lifetime, most people will have a challenge with their mental fitness, just like we all have obstacles to overcome our physical fitness at times. Some of us will experience unhappiness, stress and anxiety, but not everyone will experience mental illness. This isn't just about poor mental health. We're recognising that mental health is about life experiences and the pressures of the world we live in. Mental health is part of the bigger picture of human performance. Part of that recognition is the proven fact of how inseparable physical and mental health are. That our wellness depends on our spiritual, physical, emotional and mental well-being. It's a whole life daily journey we all live. It's a continuous part of life and the sooner we recognise the importance of well-being focus as individuals, the better managed our life will be. Prince Harry said, I truly believe that good mental health Mental fitness is the key to powerful leadership, productive communities, and a purpose-driven self. I, like many others, grew up in an armed forces that was much more unaware and unaccepting of the subject of mental illness, and indeed of the concept of mental fitness as it is today. That is not necessarily the fault of the organisation at that time, but a reflection of our society then, and its approach to mental health and wellbeing. I joined the army in the late 1980s and grew up in a tough, male-dominated, macho environment where poor mental health was seen as a weakness. It was a taboo subject and not something that was ever spoken of other than in a humorous context, usually at somebody else's expense. There are still elements of that today, and in talking more about this subject, we can and will break down that stigma attached to it. I'm not an expert in mental health but I can speak from personal experience when I say that regardless of how big and tough people think they are, stress, anxiety, and poor mental health can catch anybody off guard and change their life considerably. Mental health is about how we think, feel, and behave every single day. Poor mental health comes in many forms and usually without warning. It's important that we are alive to the signs in ourselves and others. I'm embarrassed to say that for 29 years of my 33 year career, I was naive to mental illness and the effects it can have on somebody until I was affected myself. Only then did I start to get a true understanding of the problem. In many cases, people have to reach the point of crisis before they realize that they were suffering from some form of mental ill health. I reached that point of crisis and soon became very aware of the true meaning of poor mental health. Anyone that knows me would tell you that I would be the last person they would ever expect to suffer from mental health issues. I genuinely believe that I would never become affected. I was indestructible. But let me tell you that mental ill health doesn't discriminate, nor does it choose its timing. It can come when you least expect it, and sometimes you don't even realise you're experiencing poor mental health. 
Having served on nine operational tours and seen trauma, death, grotesque life-changing injuries, and having administered life-saving first aid, you would think that if I was likely to suffer from men any mental illness, then it would be PTSD. Well, you would be wrong. My mental health issues came 29 years into my career when I was in the role of the Army Sergeant Major. No one had ever filled the position before. There were naysayers, blockers, and a good deal of jealousy against me, which was always in the back of my mind as I tried to establish a new and highly influential role. I needed to make this job a success and make it irreversible. I had to make sure it worked. I needed to learn about the complexities of the army and that involved a huge amount of travel. On average, I would only get two nights a week in my own bed, which would take its toll on my family. When I established the role in 2015, I could see that there was a little senior presence on social media. So I set up a Twitter account to help me learn about the organization and to hopefully inform others of some of the work I was doing. In doing so, and putting my head above the parapet as a new member of the establishment, I received a lot of unexpected trolling, mostly by people that had never met me, who had little understanding of what my role entailed, and who had an axe to grind with the military. I had never experienced such hate-filled trolling, and for someone with little experience of it, found it hard to deal with. I took it personally and didn't know, know how to deal with it. Every time I responded, it exacerbated the problem. That mixed with the travel, the workload, and my self-induced pressure to perform, I started drinking more than usual. I had no time to think logically. I was going from one event to another, and any spare time I did have was spent reading in preparation for the next. Many of the events I attended were charity or military sport-based. They often involved alcohol and social networking, and being a soldier, I obviously found it hard to turn down free booze. In the first two years of the job, I'd gone from the occasional tipple at a weekend to drinking every day, sometimes to excess, even in my own home. It helped me relax and made me feel better, so I did it more and more. I became dependent. I never made it visible and always gave the impression that I drank sensibly at events and would always leave at the earliest opportunity. I've always been able to go to sleep quickly, but I've always woken early. In that job, I was waking at three, 3.30, 4, 4.30, 5. I would then get my PT in. I always did and still do my PT early in the morning as a regime. With a lot of alcohol in my system, little sleep, lots of PT, stress of social media and the job, little did I know it had started to take its toll. I knew I was wired, but I thought I was resilient and mentally tough. No way could this stress break me. I was a machine, I'll keep pushing, I'll take more on, I'll handle this, all will be fine. One day I went to the doctor for a knee injury, a standard medical appointment. I was hoping for some ibuprofen and a tube grip would be sent on my merry way. The doctor started to ask the usual questions. Everything else okay? How are you sleeping? How much do you drink? I lied like most of us do and told him that I didn't drink uh, much when clearly I was drinking way too much. Then out of nowhere, I felt this intense, heat building inside of my body, like I was going to combust. I'd never suffered from anxiety or panic before, and I suddenly felt like I had an ostrich egg in my throat, and I knew I was going to break down. It came, and it didn't stop for about 10 minutes. I was sobbing like a child in front of my doctor, a six foot four, 17 stone, tattooed army sergeant major, crying my eyes out, and I didn't even know why. The doctor diagnosed me with stress, anxiety, and depression. I had what is commonly known as burnout. I'd literally worked myself to exhaustion. Add on the social media pressure and abuse, and this machine was broken. I was given meds, which I could take for a further seven months, and I was downgraded, although that actually made no difference to my poor performance whatsoever. Although I was hugely embarrassed, I felt a sense of relief. A sense of relief because I now knew what was happening to me but I still had to go home and tell my wife. The 10 minute journey home took two hours. And when I got to the door, I felt like I was composed and good to go. Door opened and it came again. I broke down in front of my wife, which was more embarrassing than in front of the doctor. I didn't cry in front of people. I was a man. At least that was the mindset that had stuck with me since being a child. Remember at this stage, my wife thought I'd gone to the doctor for a knee injury 
And now she was worried that I'd been diagnosed with a terrible terminal illness. I confessed and told her what was wrong and she was relieved. She'd known all along that something was wrong and I just hadn't listened to her. My relief was instant. I had an epiphany. I knew I had a mental ill health and I wanted to recover. This was to be the start of my mental health journey. Although minor to many other people's mental health journeys, it had a massive effect on me and my family. And now I had to rectify that. And I also needed to work out how to help others and prevent the same happening to them. Marcus Aurelius said, don't be ashamed to need help. Like a soldier storming a wall, you have a mission to accomplish. And if you've been wounded and you need a comrade to pull you up, so what? I didn't have the courage to tell my story for the rest of my time as the Army Sergeant Major. That stigma and fear of letting people know kept me from doing so. When I became the SEAC, I saw an opportunity and volunteered to become the first Armed Forces Mental Health and Wellbeing Champion, a position from which I could advocate positive mental health and help break down stigma. And here we are some two years later, lecturing on the subject at RUSI. The work that Defence and the single services have done in this space is commendable, and I and many others are extremely proud thus far of the collective effort that has gone into the subject of mental health in the armed forces. Many people do not understand the impact that poor mental health can have on a person until they experience it themselves, or if someone they love and care for suffers from a mental illness. I used to be judgmental of other people, I used to decide in my own head whether or not an individual should present to a medical professional based on my knowledge of that person. But not anymore. I no longer judge and I believe that everybody should have the opportunity to present with what they believe is a concern with their mental health. We all live different lives and face our own challenges. None of us are the same. All of us think differently and we all cope in different ways. This is our journey and one that each of us live. Lord Moran, doctor to Winston Churchill, stated in his World War I study of psychological effects of war, the soldier is alone in his war with terror, and we have to recognise the first signs of his defeat that we may come in time to his rescue. The armed forces has a whole life approach to mental health awareness and provision. And whilst from a defence perspective, we must focus our military resources on our serving personnel and families, the whole life approach that we continue to develop with the NHS and our charity sector is one I, as well as many others, are very proud of. Media portrayal and a lack of awareness from the general public would have many people think that those that currently do or have served in the military are all severely and mentally disadvantaged by our military experiences. There is a perception that we are likely to end up homeless on the streets or that a high percentage of us may try to take our own life as a result of trauma witnessed on past operational tours. When you consider that the rate of PTSD remains low at two in 1,000 people, these views are misguided at best and a damaging attitude for our veterans' future at worst. The overall rate of mental health in serving personnel is broadly comparable to that seen in the UK population. And the rate of mental health for those needing specialist mental health treatment, such as depressive episodes or stress and anxiety, is also lower than that seen in the UK population. But there is more to be done. Secretary of State for Defence Ben Wallace said in Parliament on Tuesday, for many, being in the armed forces is one of the best times of their lives. For those whom all is not well, we must do more. As a country, we have a responsibility for our people, for those that have served and continue to serve. For those that do need extra help in order to improve transition from service life to civilian life, Veterans can access Defence Department's Community Mental Health, or DCMH, for up to six months beyond their discharge date. They will, where necessary, be transferred to the NHS for continued treatment. In 2016, the government launched an NHS Veterans Mental Health Transition Service, or TILS, and over recent years amongst the Complex Treatment Service, High Intensity Service, and the Veterans Trauma Network. The criteria to access at any time following service, be it months or years, is that you should have served in the UK Armed Forces for a full day. Veterans UK, part of the Ministry of Defence, recognises leaving service is complex. And as my own end of service date looms ever closer, 
I recognise that this can be an emotional time, not just for us that serve, but our families as well. We're also incredibly fortunate in the array of phenomenal charities that support us. And it would be remiss of me not to say thank you for the hugely important work you do in support of the whole armed forces community. We, the NHS, and charities that support us share one aim, to improve service life and the likelihood of successful transition of our military personnel and families into civilian life. We will consistently work with the government, the private sector and our dedicated charitable sectors to improve the journey and identify gaps. Military mental health provision and awareness is at a level unlike anything I remember throughout my 33 year career. And the current health crisis has raised that awareness even further. Defence has worked extremely hard to improve awareness as well as provision of care with our mental health services. We've had a mental health strategy since 2017 and we have launched numerous initiatives across defence. We have an annual summary of armed forces mental health that captures data and trends from a 2007 baseline. And in period 2019 to 2020, we now know that armed forces who were seen by a specialist mental health clinician remain stable at one in 37, so 2.7%. The highest percentage of conditions treated were adjustment disorders and depressive episodes. Personnel from all age groups accessed military mental health care with more women than men seeking support. We see a higher percentage of other ranks and higher numbers of personnel aged between 20 and 44. When you consider that the most common cause of death for men aged between 18 to 55 in the UK general population is suicide, we still have some way to go to grow confidence and inculcate behavioural change. I therefore will and do caution that statistics aren't everything, due in part to the complexities of medical data and the fact that each person has an individual care pathway. They are not the absolute. They do, however, give us key areas for focus and are a guide rail for our culture. There are many different types of common mental illnesses, and we would all be wise to be aware of what they are and how they can affect our personnel, from PTSD to some symptoms of the menopause to bulimia to bipolar. Whether it be research, data, care pathways or resources allocated, the intricacies of mental health dictates there will always be more to do more to learn, more to resource, more to educate. Our aspiration is that every member of the armed forces will receive training and education in mental health from the day they join the service to the day they leave, thus setting them up for success when they transition into their veteran life thereafter. This has to be part of the curriculum in the same way that physical health is. We are ensuring that our armed forces personnel have the psychological resilience training they need to recognise mental ill health in themselves, those around them, and know how to manage their lives to stay mentally and physically healthy. When you think of human performance, you think of an athlete, but our people have to be better than that. They have to be able to operate and be deployable for every eventuality, 24-7, 365 days a year. To do that, you need to be at your best physically, mentally and emotionally. Whilst we're on the subject of deployability, we deploy mental health professionals to all theatres of operation, ensuring that support is offered to every service person before and after deployment. Post-operational stress management is firmly embedded throughout the armed forces as part of the decompression and normalisation process for service personnel returning from operations. Much has to be done. Much has been done over the last two years to better equip our service personnel and their families in their everyday lives, such as the collaboration with the Royal Foundation, which resulted in the launch of the impressive headfit.org, an online resource for all service personnel and their families, and anyone else for that matter, to utilise. In January 21, a review into apps, websites and helplines available was completed. These recommendations will be developed to ensure a coherent message, with the consideration that often the sheer amount of options for support out there can be overwhelming. The single services have launched their own initiatives in Regain, Op Smart, and Thriving at Work. Each program fits the needs and requirements of their particular service and focuses on educating and training people in mental resilience and self-care. 
We are introducing mandatory mental health training, which begins from April, which will help protect and strengthen the potential and resilience of our force. With each step forward, we will break down the stigma. This isn't a box ticking exercise. This is about training people in human performance skills to remain healthy and give our personnel the access to any necessary support if they show symptoms of poor mental health. This is all about promotion, prevention and deterrence. It's about a common understanding, acceptance and awareness in ourselves and in each other. It's about an inclusive, mentally healthy workplace and culture. It's a perpetual journey of growth for our organization and we all have a role in it. Dr. Zeus in the Lorac said, unless someone like you cares a whole lot, nothing's gonna get better. And whilst I recognize that I'm using a quote from a children's book, we all need to care, advocate, and understand mental health. And talking of children, wouldn't it be good if all of our children were read into this subject early on in their lives to understand these challenges? In defense, our Navy, Army, and Royal Air Force Families Federations recognize that isolation, separation, and mobility can all impact on service families' well-being. And they are doing some exceptional work in raising awareness along with various organizations. I've been blown away and even moved to tears by the courage of children through work with Scotty's Little Soldiers, a charity dedicated to supporting children who have lost a parent who served in the British Armed Forces. There is no one size fits all solution for mental health and well-being. Children, young people, civil servants, soldiers, sailors, airmen and women, veterans, families, each person is different. Each case is unique. When considering my own role as a mental health champion, I often refer back to one of my favorite Winston Churchill quotes, success is not final, it's not fatal. So failure is not fatal, it's the courage to continue that counts. Our work in mental health will never stop. There will always be more to do, more to consider, but through advocacy, we will effectively communicate our dedication to our people, increase confidence in the system to provide support and increase confidence in the individual to ask for that support. I now wanna to talk to the subject of leadership responsibility. Everybody must have the confidence that if they think they have a mental health condition, well, they just want someone to speak to that they can ask for help. That is the culture we must all work hard to create and continue to demonstrate compassionate leadership to ensure it's enduring and embedded in daily military life. I'd like to reach the point that no one should ever feel that they cannot turn to those that lead them. I'd argue that anything less is a failure of leadership. Personnel can then either be treated for mental health problems by their medical officer in their unit, be given a primary health care package tailored to the individual, or refer to specialist mental health care services. In some cases, poor mental health doesn't need medical help. They may not even need to go that far. They may just need someone to speak to without judgment or consequence. They may just need leadership advice on a mentally healthy lifestyle. They may just need a cup of tea with someone they trust and that will listen. For those that do require it, specialist mental health care is primarily delivered through 16 military departments of community mental health, DCMH, located across the UK as well as overseas. They are staffed by psychiatrists, mental health nurses, clinical psychologists and mental health social workers. A wide range of psychiatric and psychological treatments are available, including medication, psychological therapies, and social support. I've personally visited our Defence Medical Services and our DCMHs and have seen the first-hand work that they do. Utterly professional, dedicated and experts in their field. We're extremely lucky to have them. I believe that the challenge we currently face is that there are two types of stigma at present in the armed forces. They are perceived stigma and real stigma. The perceived stigma is that we in defence are doing a fantastic job in tackling mental health issues affecting our service personnel through the programmes and initiatives that I've already mentioned, supported by defence-wide awareness briefings, social media, and statistics and common knowledge. You'd be led to believe that we've overcome the problem. 
But the real stigma is that people still feel unable to present to a doctor. They are reluctant to present because of fear of being judged, fear of repercussion, of being labelled, and fear of losing the job they love. As I said, I was downgraded with no effect on performance, another moment of enlightenment. It made me realise that being downgraded is about a momentary pause from some part of military life so you can get better and give more. It's not and should not be part of the stigma. Stigma isn't necessarily unique to the military, but it's unique to our leadership responsibility. We live in a world that values us for how fast we can go, how full we can make our diary, how much we can cram into one day without a break. Being busy is seen by many as a badge of honour. It's the competitive culture we're immersed in. It's easy to prioritise work as higher than our own well-being, and in doing so, the example we set as leaders is not positive. My hope is that COVID may have changed that. I would say that leaders who find compassion through this pandemic need to make it permanent. The pandemic has highlighted to us all what we need and what we don't need, what adds value to our lives and what doesn't, what makes us stronger. We must break down the barriers to our personnel seeking mental health support in any form. We must continue to promote positive mental health and detect early warning signs of the onset of a mental health issue. Normalize mental fitness in the same way we do physical fitness. Through honesty, displaying vulnerability and strong leadership, we have a responsibility to lead our people and create a new normal that encourages our people to not showcase busy as successful, to put productivity over presentism, to be role models and demonstrate excellence in human performance for physical and mental strength. To encourage and empower those around us to do the same. The importance in mental health advocacy and our intent and our actions cannot be underestimated. It will empower those you lead to follow your lead. It will encourage our personnel to feel valued regardless of where they are on the mental health continuum. It will break down stigma and create a culture of belonging. Confucius said, life is really simple, but we insist on making it complicated. Our leadership respons responsibility is just that, to care about the health and well-being of all of our people. Because once you get that right, everything else will come. Lots of people have reached out to me as opposed to their chain of command for possibly no other reason than there is a chance they will never meet me. That makes them feel safe. That gives them the confidence to speak to me, the confidence that they haven't got within their own chain of command. They fear being labelled. They fear being judged and they fear repercussion. That needs work. Leadership is about caring for those that you lead. And if somebody has the courage to come to you with mental health concerns, then it's your duty to support them. As leaders, we also need to know and look after ourselves. And that is what I call reliable leadership, to ensure circumstances do not dictate our emotional behavior, to not fly off the handle or appear stressed or unapproachable. That means we have to stay true to our values, our ethics and standards, and part of knowing ourselves means strong mind, strong body, and looking after ourselves and our own mental health. Our people look up to us. They expect more. They need us to role model the right behaviours. We can't just talk this. We have to live it. I live by a rule of 10, a daily mantra. I do this to look after myself, so I'm at the top of my game but those that I work with know it as well. The people I work and engage with know they can trust me to be there, consistently trust me. Now to the subject of individual responsibility. Having a mental illness is not your fault, but it is your responsibility. Mental illnesses are an illness just like any other. When you have a cold, it's not your fault for coughing or having a high temperature, but we do seek help or take cold remedies. In the same vein, when you're creeping up the mental health continuum away from fully fit, it's not your fault for the symptoms that you exhibit, whatever they may be, but it's your responsibility, whether that is seeking help or learning how to cope. 
I would challenge each of you to better understand your coping strategies, stress thresholds, and where your mental health is on a daily basis. I would challenge you to better understand how circumstances affect you and also your impact on those that are close, be that family, friends, or colleagues. Just like physical fitness, it's our individual duty to do everything we can to look after our own mental fitness. Our minds need training just the same as our body does. Without it, we leave ourselves open to injury in the physical sense and illness in the mental sense. But like all things, we're not always motivated. So we have to remain disciplined in our training. I knew, I knew that I had to manage my life differently after being diagnosed and I came up with a plan of action that I still use to this day to manage my mental health. Sometimes I still have the odd bad day, usually as a result of negative social media, but I know how to try and prevent it, to try and rise above it, to deal with it in the best way that I can. That's what we need to do as individuals. We've all faced our own journeys with this pandemic, and depending on who you are, it's impacted our lives. Some in a negative sense and some in a positive. Some have found the pandemic to be hugely challenging and are desperate for some normality. And some have actually faced, reflected and uh, changed their lifestyle choices as a result. I'm in the camp of the latter. From a personal perspective, I've been able to use the last year to review my life management. Since my own mental health issues, I've consistently managed my life but this last year, I've been able to really focus on what's been important and what hasn't. I've started new good habits and I've stopped the bad ones. Well, some of them anyway. Because I found myself working from home for the best part of the year, I'm actually more productive. I can fit more in and my outputs are significantly higher. I've also found that working from home has actually given me more opportunity to spend some quality time with my family, a family that hasn't seen much of me over the last 25 years. But it didn't happen overnight. Initially, lockdown was difficult. I felt I had no purpose. I felt redundant, like I'd lost my way. We all struggle with the inherent uncertainty of change, particularly when forced upon us with speed. It's no surprise that adjustment disorder is one of our highest recorded mental health conditions in the armed forces. Negative emotions can dominate, and there is often a degree of human resistance and emotional turmoil with change. I fortunately realised that this was going to be the way it was for some time, and I had to find a routine. But it took effort and thought. I figured out I needed to separate my week from my weekend. There had to be time for work and time for my family. I had to make sure I didn't blur the lines of work and home. I also had to really focus and keep on top of my own mental fitness and didn't slip back into old habits, particularly where social media was involved. I earlier made reference to social media. And I think it important that I speak to it briefly. Human beings are social creatures. We need the companionship of others to thrive in life. And the strength of our connections has a huge impact on our mental health and happiness. Being socially connected through social media has exponentially increased during COVID and it can ease anxiety, boost self-worth, provide comfort and prevent loneliness. On the flip side, there can be a very negative side to social media that can pose a serious risk to your mental and emotional health. Sometimes social media can be a very dark place full of hatred and jealousy. And the freedom that these social media platforms offer gives people the opportunity to express their opinion without consequence. I have witnessed and experienced unacceptable behavior on social media. I have received death threats and threats on my family. I have been made aware of incidences seriously affecting the mental health of some of our service personnel and their families. Most of the incidences I refer to come from our military community, which extends to anybody that thinks they are worthy of being part of that collective, anonymous accounts included. These actions are beneath us and are frankly unacceptable. We're a tight-knit military community, and at times of remembrance and reflection, we all appear to come together from regular to reserve to veteran and cadet in solidarity and strength. I will not labour the point, but COVID has taught us we should and can show that empathy and togetherness all year round. We are always stronger together. Through COVID, I consider myself one of the lucky ones. I've had to deal with the, I haven't have not had to deal with death or grief, manage homeschooling, or look after aging parents. I've reconnected with my family at a new level 
and have had the constant company of a particularly amazing miniature poodle called Rufus that helps me with my well-being on a daily basis with dog walking. I know that others may not have had this experience. Some of those around us, be their friends, family or colleagues, continue to need additional support or just kindness. It's one of the reasons I remind and encourage any serving personnel, regardless of rank or service, that I will always listen should they want to get in touch. I mentioned my rule of 10, a mantra, a basic set of rules to live my life by. That rule of 10 incorporates physical, mental and spiritual training every single day. It makes me concentrate on my diet and my sleep to ensure that I get the correct nutrition and rest required to make me perform at my personal best. Physical training is a way of life for me. It's my therapy. It's what makes me feel mentally healthy and completes my day. To stay emotionally balanced, I meditate and practice mindfulness every day. I make a point of getting outside, into nature, observing, breathing, and being happy to be alive. Not everyone would agree with my own personal regime, and some find it hard to manage their lives in such a way. Some people find it hard to find the time to juggle family commitments and self-care, home life and work life, and motivation versus fatigue. This change has been forced upon us. Some people embrace change. Some people passively or aggressively resist it. Some people react emotionally to it. It's not easy, but it's about knowing yourself and finding what's right for you. Heraclitus said, there is nothing permanent except change, and COVID has proven that. COVID has been a call to arms. Now is the time for us all to make a difference. We all now have an opportunity to bring the subject of mental health to the forefront of everything we do. It's highlighted the importance of self-care, and it's highlighted the need for solidarity, teamwork, awareness, and resilience, and it's shown how vitally important our medical and frontline services are. We do not yet know the full impact of COVID on mental health, and we are in the midst of ongoing research of that impact on armed forces personnel. But I do know that increased pressure, isolation, restrictions, and the unknown has impacted us all. We must all be more accepting. We must all be less judgmental. We must lead through the pandemic and the months and years that follow with compassionate and reliable leadership. We that lead must be reliable. We must recognise our own strengths and weaknesses and have the confidence to seek help when we need to. When we look back at where we were, we can start to measure how far we have come in the mental health journey. We still have much to do. And our goal will always be the mental health and well-being of our people. This journey will never end. Our success must be measured in increments, each milestone achieved, each person supported. We're all different human beings. We all have different needs and we all face different challenges. With a better understanding of each other, with more tolerance, with less judgment and a mix of strong and caring leadership, we can and will fight through and learn from this health crisis. Our organisation values our people. They are at the very heart of all we do. And as we understand and deepen our knowledge of human connection and relationships, including those with self, we will all be the stronger for it. Individually fit, operationally fit, mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. To be competitive, adaptable, and ready for today and all of our tomorrows. Thank you. Glenn, genuinely, that was a real privilege to listen to your personal story and thank you so much for sharing it. A lot of the comments that, that have come through have been people saying how grateful they are that you have decided to share it and use this forum to do so. And I've got to say there have been some requests which we'll follow up on to try and get this, the transcript of your speech uh, put out there, we'll add it to the website and put it down. There are some really important pieces in there for people to grasp onto. I guess in the short time we've got left, I'm going to try and pull together some of the questions that are there. And, and I think you can you know, broadly theme it into, into four or five areas and I'll try and get through them. But the first one I think is the really biggest one. And, and it's a theme that came out right through your, your lecture. And it, it's really about 
you know, the culture that has underpinned the military for so long, which has been related to drinking, it's been related to camaraderie, it's been related to the sense of support that we get through a military community. But, but that, in many ways, there's a tension there because not only is there support, but there's also parts that are pulling apart from it. It's, it's built around a heavy drinking community. It's built around toughness, around uh, no vulnerability. It, it feels like it's almost impossible to get to. Now, you might be leading a change, but some of the questions are from organisations that maybe aren't at that level of maturity yet with mental health. What pieces of advice could you give to units to say, this is how you can step forward? This is how you can move forward down that mental health journey, not just individually, but as a collective formation. No, that's a great question. I think, uh, I think firstly, I think um, vulnerability and leadership is, is key um, in that. And I, I hope that that's what I've kind of shown in um, today's lecture. And we talk about it often in the military and just over the last couple of weeks, certainly with Time to Talk Day, I think examples of General Patrick Sanders and Colonel Tim Borton um, giving their own examples, just like I have in this method. And former special forces operators that we've seen over social media doing the same. That vulnerability in leadership, I think, uh, has changed the way we do our business. It's changed uh, uh, our acceptance and it's helping to break down the stigma in our organisation. But it's taken us a long time to get there. And you're right that what, what could be perceived as almost in some respect by some people, this pink, fluffy, caring organisation now, you know, looking after people's mental health doesn't quite go in line with the, the hard drinking culture of old and, you know, closing with and killing the enemy on operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. But that's the leadership challenge. Um, that's, that's why we are unique and that's why we are who we are. That's why the British military is so good at what they're doing. We can adapt, we're flexible, um, and that's exactly what we're doing now. And over the last 15 years of campaign in Iraq and Afghanistan, and the introduction of trauma risk management, and now the way we've changed, and we've learned from um, past experiences to the point we're at now, it's all down to us looking, inwardly looking. I think we've, we've looked into our souls and we've worked out what we need to do. And I think, I think we've changed our, our behaviours for the better. And all of the organisations I speak to on this subject, you're right, they do ask that question often. And much of it comes down to, I think, our, our homegrown resilience, life skills that we learn in the military, and also the teamwork, the camaraderie, the brotherhood and the sisterhood, and that's what gets us through. But this new way of living, I think, is, and the human performance side, I think it's all going to come together in the future and continue. But it is really important it does that, because in many ways, we... we... We had this, the, the British Armed Forces accelerated their mental health treatment and, and training throughout Iraq and Afghanistan, particularly in, the, I, I guess, the last five years of that. Enormous. Yeah. But the capacity hasn't caught up with the requirement in many ways. And they continue to sort of filter in as requirements. I mean, you know, you can't deny that the forces have done really well in terms of getting hold of mental health practitioners and putting them in funding places. And there's a couple of guys on the chat who have been pushing forward, you know, their own ability to do it and how do they get involved. But there is a problem with capacity and, and it will be exacerbated for the armed forces, won't it, with, with COVID and the impacts of mental health on people. Is there something that we can get to with prevention rather than cure? Because, you know, it doesn't just manifest itself in terms of depression, you know, it might be schizophrenia, it might be psychosis, it might be gambling, it might be drugs. There's got to be something that we can get to before that. Do you think there's a program that the, the chief can get on board with that would allow us to start tackling this upstream more? Well, I think that's kind of what we've done already and with the chiefs signing their statement of commitment to, to the whole mental health program. And the, the programs that I talked about earlier, certainly HeadFit, OpSmart as an example. So OpSmart has briefed 26,000 people this year alone on that whole mental um, resilience training. So you're right, it is all about promotion. It's all about prevention. It's all about deterrence. The treatment, you know, that's out of my lane. That's the other side of the MO. That's our defence medical services. And like I said in the speech, they are brilliant at what they do but you know there's there's a shortage of of psychiatric nurses mental health nurses in the country let alone in in the military um, so that's a trouble a struggle and the more people um, you know that are being affected through this this pandemic the more people are slowly going to be coming forward and you know not for me to answer but in terms of resourcing and you know countrywide getting people in to, to support the, the needs of mental health across the country I think it's going to be a really important one in coming years. 
and I guess that's the point, you know, that and, and there are loads of good questions, you know, Sarah, Ian, Adam, James, Ben, Mike, uh, there's just a whole host of questions out there. But in many ways, some of them are asking the reverse of it. You know, we, we've done really well in terms of the armed forces in stepping up. We're not there yet, as you point out, but we're doing really well. But but there is going to be this growing requirement, not just in the NHS, but in wider society for mental health treatments after COVID. It's had a, a, an enormous impact on the health of society, the mental health of society, as well as the physical one. Are there lessons that we can provide in the armed forces and feed back into both the NHS and society, but maybe perhaps focus it on the NHS. What can we take back to them? How can we facilitate the lessons that were hard won for us in Iraq and Afghanistan in terms of treatment? How can we feed those back into the NHS? So to be honest, I think we're already doing it. And a lot of the frontline services, certainly the NHS, have already been tapping into, into our services and into defence to see how, how they can benefit and how they can learn from our experience, particularly in the areas not necessarily of, of mental health, um, but, but within that, if you think about PTSD, think about trauma, um, trauma risk management, that kind of stuff. We, we have been doing that for a long time now. We've had people um, seeing those grotesque images on operations for the best part of 15, 20 years. And we've had people returning from operations from, um, you know, an operation back into normalization, the whole post-operational stress management thing. So I think the NHS and other organizations could learn from our trauma risk management processes. They could learn from our post-operational stress management um, examples. They could learn from our resilience training, that whole piece of, you know, the day you join the services to the day you leave. And that through career training and education is what we're aiming for and what we're going to tackle and the mandatory stuff. Perhaps the NHS and other organizations should be doing exactly the same uh, when you think of how they've been affected with the pandemic. Glenn, listen, we, we've run out of time. Thank you so much for sharing what was a, a, a deeply personal and very powerful reflection on where we sit. Uh, and I feel honoured that we were allowed to have it at Rusi. Uh, thank you all to the guests for attending. For our next event you might be interested in is the CPAC conference on the 25th of Feb, held virtually. And I'd like to thank the Rusi Events and Com teams for getting this event together. And to you as guests for attending, great questions. It's my fault we didn't get to them all. Uh, we will try and follow up on those that we can. A special thanks, of course, to Glenn for coming and giving such a powerful lecture today. Finally, I'd like to take this opportunity to remind you that Rusi is a membership organization and a charity. Now, Netflix only has so much to offer. Many of you will have been through every box set known to humanity. So why not exercise your mind, sate your curiosity by joining and becoming a member of the Institute? I can guarantee it will take you outside your intellectual comfort zone. Details are at rusi.org forward slash membership. And if you want an independent view on that, Rusi recently won the Prospect Magazine Think Tank of the Year. Recommendations don't come better than that.